Um, thanks, Darren, and thanks to Neil, who um, dragged me into this and uh, convinced me to do a, um, a presentation on the early days. Um, uh, wear Eco Tea, I'm Eco Dave, this is Eco Nick. I could not convince her to wear the Wonder Woman outfit, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> that's a classic um, photo we did way back for an ideology um, uh, promotional campaign. Um, ideology is one of the early teams, as you'll hear about. And they actually um, did some print, no, TV media or something at the time, because they're rich, as you'll find out, and um, that, or they had connections and they were actually able to get uh, TV or some advertising space and they wanted, um, and some print campaigns, so they wanted a photo for that and uh, there's Eco Nick in her handmade Wonder Woman outfit, uh, which she wore to a, um, uh, what a fancy dress party or something, and uh, we thought we'd add the GPS and there it is. And the ad was Wonder What to Wear, and they were selling their merchandise, so that was the whole idea. Anyway, uh, let's get on to it. I could waffle <coughs> on for hours, so um, if I am actually going over time, please uh, give me the hurry up. Um, now, I wasn't sure what to come up with, so I slapped together some stuff, and I hope everyone finds it suitable. And if my voice goes, you'll have to, um, you'll have to forgive me, because um, it's not the best at the moment. So. Um, the early days, we joined in August 2001, um, and at the time we thought we were, you know, we were latecomers. We felt, oh God, it's geocaching's been going since um, May 2000. Um, and we really felt like latecomers at the time, but as it turns out, no, we're one of the, we're now deemed to be one of the early founders on the Sydney scene at least. Um, and it was a very small community back then. You came in and there were probably half a dozen major teams and that was that was pretty much it um, as I'll go through in a sec um, and it was quite a secret little community people at the time we did actually want to keep it out of the media and not have um, formal um, uh, rules and things for it it was very um, and we sort of kept it all under the radar there was no associations and things like you have these days and um, Basically, ten, if you had 10 finds, you were a major player. So if you came onto the scene, there were more than half a dozen players. There were probably, I don't know, 15, maybe even 20, but they'd only found one or two caches and they hadn't hidden, or they'd only hidden one and they didn't really play the game. So there were only half a dozen major teams. And if you found 10, if you roared to 10 caches, you were a major player and um, of course everyone knows that you know 10 you can easily find 10 in a day these days and all of Australia only had a hundred geocaches in all of, or under a hundred and in Sydney I don't know 30 at the time maybe 20 caches in Sydney when we joined in 2001 so it was going actually very um, it was a very slow start for geocaching no digital maps like you have these days we had the compass we had a GPS without the compass, so you'll see heaps of photos of me wearing my, uh, <coughs> uh, wearing my compass, and I still do. If I go out caching, I don't have any more advanced tools than the Sidway Street Directory, the old Garmin E-Trek Sheila, and, our, um, and I don't even download them into the thing. And, you know, it was, it was a very early days, and it felt like cheating. If you use digital maps, or if you even, um, automatically downloaded your caches into your GPS unit, it was almost cheating at the time. So there was no geocaching Swiss Army knife program and stuff like that. They did come along about six months later. It was quite a rapid, um, a rapid advancement back then. I even wrote my own mapping program called GeoMap, if anyone remembers that, but uh, that was very old. And there were food in caches, believe it or not. Not many people know the Freddo Frog is the semi-official mascot of geocaching New South Wales or geocaching Sydney. Smile. <laughs> and yet yeah, the Freddo frog. You would find Freddo frogs in almost every cache in Sydney. And I know it's frowned upon but back then it was good fun. And there were signature items which I'll go into. Now I better get a move on. Um, here's a graph of, you may have seen it, I stole it from Geocaching Australia, a map of um, uh, active caches um, in number, up to from zero to a thousand uh, time, and we joined August 2001 there. So as you can see, and the red line is the number of hiders. So this is the number of caches, 
at the active caches, and this is the number of um, people who actually find, or oh, uh, place caches, sorry. And we joined right down here. We're pretty much, there was a one on one. Everyone who cached placed a cache as well. It was, and it only started to diverge here. It came back a little bit here, but we joined around about this point. So it's quite remarkable to see the um, rapid progression in the number of um, caches. As you can see, there are only about 20 active geocaches in New South Wales, by the way. This is not Australia, this is just New South Wales. And maybe the Sydney scene, as I will go on to have about half a dozen. Now, the major players, when we joined back then, um, there were basically five. There were Ideology, Team Chaos, GM Monkeys, the Two Dogs, Tangles. The Odd Leads technically came after us, but I'm going to put them because they placed some um, groundbreaking caches back in the day. They joined a couple of weeks after us, I think. But, you know, those, if you went out caching on the weekend, you're going to run into one of these guys. That was pretty much it. That was the whole community, believe it or not. And there were one or, you know, odd people, as I said, might go out and find one cache, maybe, or, or you know, one cache every, every month or something. But these were the active places and the active um, finders as well. And then we came along, and that was it. Um, if you don't know, Ideology are a very um, secretive team. They don't really um, cache anymore, but they were, um, the rumour has it, dot-com millionaires, and they would cache by limousine, they'd cache by, um, they'd have Porsche, a Lotus, They'd fly their helicopter. You've probably heard the stories of ideology. And they used fake names. They called themselves George. So you never knew their real names. It was George and George as a, um, as a bit of an in-joke. So um, Team Chaos, a very famous team. They had some merchandise. Geocat uh, monkeys who are still active. Um, you'll know them. Two dogs, um, Snifter and Hound Dog, who you'll still know. They still cache tangles, as you know, wants nothing to do with uh, geocaching. Um, Australia or the association, he believes that it's evil and all that sort of stuff and he doesn't want to get involved, so you won't find his caches on geocaching Australia. Is that correct, still? No, he's pulled most of them. He's pulled all his caches out, yeah. And the odd lids, they don't, they're not in the game anymore, um, but we'll go into that. So they were the major teams and it really wasn't very many. And as you can see, we joined very early on, two dogs, I'm not sure if you can read that, um, two Dogs, Geo Monkeys, Team Chaos, Devils, who I think weren't even in Sydney. I don't actually remember doing one of their caches. Eco Team, Odd Lids. And um, then Swampy came along. Um, Riblet, who you'll know. Uh, uh, the Bronze, who I'm not sure if he's doing it anymore. Mind Socket, who does it occasionally. He's a good mate of ours. And that's basically the number of days. Um, so we started caching 3,000. 238 days ago, oh my god, and we've only found 300 and something. It's disgusting. <laughs> going into that. Now, um, early competition. Competition these days is, well, I don't know, because I have cased too much these days, but it's all about number of finds, um, it, once you hit your thousand milestone, number of um, finds in a day. What's the record for Australia? Anyone know? 240 in a day. That's almost our entire thing over 10 years. It's just, it's just crazy. We actually held the record of seven in a day um, back then, and everyone went, who cares? Who cares how many you do in a day? That's pointless. Um, but now it seems to be a big thing, and it's trivial to do seven in a day. God, but back then it was a massive feat, really, when there's only 50 in, in Sydney and you've done half of them, um, or they'd be puzzle caches or something like that. Um, and really, no one had hit 100. When we came on the scene, 100 seemed like, wow, if you could get 100 caches, we couldn't even imagine having 100 caches in Sydney, um, let alone cachers actually finding them. Um, it was just remarkable. And so the numbers weren't that important because there were so few caches um, out there that you just really wouldn't uh, bother, you know, with a uh, number of caches. As soon as you hit 10, you're a major player. So that was a big milestone, hit double digits. and. Um, I'm not sure when, I should have done my research, when somebody first hit 100, it might have been Tangles. We were, we were actually leading at one point, I think, and yeah, I don't know, we got overtaken. Um, but the race was to get signature items, and I go into signature items, but if you scored an ideology hat in one of their primo caches or in one of their things, you're a major player, you probably, if you went to the event the other month, you've probably seen a lot of the early teams that are wearing these ideology hats and these, if you got one of these, they were like the primo um, item. 
And, um, but yeah, the real fun was actually doing um, the new caches that came out. The, every cache seemed to be new in some way, a new type of way to find it, a new type of puzzle, prizes, um, it had had new merchandise in it, things like that. So let's go on. So yeah, the merchandise, we had our Eco Team Eco Bag, which I don't have one. Um, Chaos Cash was big back then, and this was a good way to get the community involved in the, um, in the uh, you know, just actually actively going, going out there and find it. You'd find Chaos Cash like this, I'll pass it around. You've probably, I um, guarantee you've never seen one. Um, no. But you would collect. There's one cache left that has chaos cash. There's one cache with chaos cash. What one's that? Uh, final cut. Final cut. Oh, final cut. Oh, jeez. Okay, there you go. <laughs> I don't know what you can buy with chaos cash anymore. But um, uh, that's the. Uh, who's on that one? The captain. captain. Yeah, on the five hundred dollar note, and they would print their own money, and you'd trade it for various um, items, a patch or something else. Um, and of course, you know, ideology gear was, was all the rage to find that. So that's what we competed for, really, was um, the competition caches and merchandise. Um, I guess it's similar these days, geocoins maybe. I'm not into the geocoin thing, but it's probably very similar these days. Do people go out and actively hunt geocoins, special coins, all that sort of thing? Yeah. Um, but it's, I don't think it's as much competition as what we had. Now, <coughs> mega caches, this is what um, uh, Neil wanted me to talk about. Back then, we had what's called mega caches, and there was no strict definition for the term, but it basically was um, a cache which was hyped for months beforehand. Um, one of our ones, which I'll go to, the, our web page had a countdown timer on it. There's 12 days, 15 hours, and 10 seconds left until the cache is released, and people would get all excited to go out and uh, hunt it down. Um, plus, you'd use other geocaching, uh, other geocaches as characters. You'd Photoshop them, and you'd give them uh, weird character names. You'd integrate it into the theme. It had dedicated web pages, um, secret winners page where you only got to if you found the cache. So it was a real badge of honour to know that web address. Um, and they trophies, prizes, as I'll go into. Um, and a mega cache can just be an elaborate puzzle cache. It didn't have to be called a mega cache. Some were, some weren't. Uh, but it's just basically a big theme cache. Now, some of the memorable ones when we joined Achilles, um, that was the first mega cache, the first big one, which was um, uh, which was um, around before we started. We hadn't even heard of it before we started caching, so it was a big thing. Our own one, MacGyver, play it again, Sam, happily ever after, fifth element, and the big one, first interactive cache, get smart, which I'll go into. I'll only go through a couple of these in detail. So, um, Achilles, yes, this was around before we came on the scene, because we actually, um, we knew Team Chaos at the time. We didn't know they were Team Chaos, and we had lunch with them, and they told us, I already knew about geocaching, but they told us about this Achilles cache, this mega cache, where you'd go out and you'd save Sydney, basically. Um, it was themed on the Mission Impossible theme, um, and it was placed by Ideology, who were this mysterious team. As I said, they went around, they flew helicopters, drove Porsches, went limous you know, drove around in limousines to place their caches and find them. Um, and it was really the first cache which had a custom designed micro cache container by Gizmo Dave in the US. I don't know if he's still around, but um, that was a big thing. You had this custom, not just a bit of Tupperware or an ammo box, it was this little custom micro cache. So it was quite a big deal. Um, and ideology specialised in urban embarrassment. Uh, what that was is basically all, most of the caches at the time. Uh, were just, you know, they were hidden in the bush, easy to find, or might be hard to find, but um, they weren't really embarrassing. You had no one watching you when you actually uh, did them. So, you know, it, was, it, it wasn't, um, it was, they were real easy to go out and hunt for. But um, ideology specialised in making you totally embarrassed in public. And, one, and Achilles was actually placed below their penthouse in North Sydney, Moore's uh, Cope's Lookout in North Sydney, so they could overlook watching you actually do the cache, and they would secretly film you actually trying to hunt for the cache in public. So, um, 
Yeah, and basically, how could you not want to do it? You saved Sydney from the Achilles virus. It was fantastic. And it'd be so hyped. And I'll go through it. This is actually from the archived winners page. And it was very cryptic. It was a puzzle case. You would get these very cryptic orders. This is actually a video. I couldn't capture the video. But even back in 2001, they would do hype videos. They would actually um, put video, Mission Impossible music, and all sorts of things. So you went to the web page. And here was this video which would encourage you to get involved and do the case, and, and it was just fantastic. It just had that mysterious uh, feel to it. So you get these weird orders that you had to decode, and it was just really bizarre. And you'd get nothing more than that, so you'd have to turn up and just use your wits. I know there's caches like that these days, puzzle caches and things, but back then it was a real novelty to actually... Um, you know, to go on a mission to hunt down this virus in this, um, in this secret little micro custom micro cache container. And they would have all sorts of things about security, how you have to take security um, seriously. And um, is that, can you actually read that stuff or is that, can anyone? <coughs> no? I don't know, yeah. I mean, this one, it might be important later on, but. Um, uh, yeah, Basically, it says, ideology, geo-intelligence has in intercepted the following en enemy transmissions. And it would just go on and on about how you... That's <coughs> Team Geo Monkeys actually hunting for the case. So they'd take photos of you while you were doing it. And they would actually um, update those on their websites um, uh, as you actually progressed through the case. Now... Oh, hello? No? What's going on? There we go. And they would um, do things like Photoshop you. That's actually Captain Chaos. He's Photoshop there. He doesn't actually have missing teeth. They were actually, <laughs> for years, you know, people thought that he had missing teeth, but he doesn't because they Photoshopped out his teeth. And this is Team Geo Monkeys who they would Photoshop their heads on people's bodies. And the Ideology website at the time, this was quite novel. They would have their own chat. Um, thing going on on their website and that was a big thing back in 2001 if anyone actually remembers the web back then was to have a um, interactive thing so you could go on there and you could type where you were up to and things like that so it was like a real time chat board and that's what these guys had on the ide ideology website it's gone now but it exists in the archives which is um, archive.org which is where I pulled all this stuff from <coughs> and um, here's us just finding um, that's at Bondi they made a search under 300 seats um, to find this thing in Bondi and um, so there's just there, yeah, there's the compass, there we go and, um, and it says you've saved Sydney, so we found the Achilles virus, how long did it take us? A couple of months? A couple of months to solve all the clues and eventually find it and it was a tough, tough case, it's a shame it doesn't exist anymore and um, so that was the Achilles virus. That was the first big mega case in New South Wales. Um, and this is our one. The MacGyver case was based on the MacGyver TV show, if anyone remembers that. Because Eco Nick's a huge fan of Richard Dean Anderson. So we did, <laughs> we did a um, case based on the MacGyver show. And this was a couple of years later, I think. I'm not sure when, when we actually did it. But basically, um, geocaches would, uh, the caches would have to go around solving these MacGyverisms, physical puzzles. And um, I, actually I actually built a real bomb, well, it wasn't a real bomb, but it was a bomb with an LCD and a countdown timer, and um, yeah, had to disarm the bomb. And um, we fooled people into thinking there was a disarm code, because it had a keypad and uh, various <coughs> clues, and you had to travel around, the, the theme was you had to travel around the world hunting down Murdoch, his arch enemy. Um, and we hyped it up with a web page, as you'll see. Um, and we had a... Uh, we had a countdown timer. This is a shot from the page, which is still there. Um, they just have, and we did. Uh, we integrated um, actual characters. I was I was MacGyver. Ek Nick was Kate Malloy, and then we integrated some of the others. Captain Chaos was Murdoch. The Ginger Loon from Team Chaos was Jack Dalton. Oddly, Dave was Pete Thornton. Snifter was Penny Parker, and we'd uh, take all these photos and we'd integrate the characters. Um, into the story. So <laughs> Geo Monkey, Prime, Bush Pusher, Leak, um, Ideology, and um, uh, Geo Pup, who I think is not around anymore. Anyone know? Geo Pup's gone. Oh, poor Geo Pup. That was um, Tangles' dog. Tangles used to take his dog 
um, geocaching. And um, you'd always get a shot of uh, thing. And we give a sneak preview, of course, and there's text down here about all these rules because it was technically in a national park. No. Uh, Aragindji Reserve. Um, yeah, it's got all these rules and we'd integrate that and we'd hype it up and we'd have a big countdown timer on there so everyone knew when it was started. And the secret winners page, if you actually finally solved it, um, you would um, figure out how we came up with the story. We spent months scouting locations. Um, we went through all, what, 500 MacGyverisms from the show to figure out which ones were safe to do and all sorts of things. And um, we eventually came up with the, with the bomb and a couple of other things. But, um, oh, by the way, a story I didn't tell. On Achilles, um, when we were doing Achilles, it was a couple of days after September 11. A couple of days after September 11 happened, and one of the waypoints for Achilles to add to your urban embarrassment was actually inside Kirribilli House. Uh, it was actually over the wall. So you'd walk up to the walls of Kirribilli House, you'd have the coordinates, and it'd say it's 10 metres over the wall of Kir Kirribilli House. So here I am, climbing the walls of Kirribilli House, a couple of days after September 11, almost getting arrested by the federal police, as it turns out, um, it wasn't physically over there, the waypoint. There's a sign, a warning sign over the wall, 10 metres in, that said, you know, keep out, you'll be arrested or shot on site or something ridiculous like that. And there was a code actually on there, um, actually on the sign that you had to read. But it took us a while to figure that, that out. So here I am trying to climb the walls of Kirribilli House and we almost got arrested a couple of days after September 11. So that's the urban embarrassment ideology we submit you to. Now, um... Uh, MacGyver, yeah, this is our winners page. Um, so to just describe how we scouted out locations, we were going to put it on an island, and we were going to have um, people construct a raft out of out of balloons and various. Because if you see MacGyver, he always um, constructs things out of stuff he has available. But we abandoned that one after we trialled it, and we sunk in there. It was the middle of winter, and we figured it was too cold, and everyone was sink and it was too hard. And, and so we came up with some water levelling. Thing at, uh, we'd hide this at, 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 at the reserve and they had to figure out how to measure two distances between here and there using just tubes and water from the waterfall which was nearby and weights. That's me building the bomb. I don't actually have a photo of the bomb but it had an LCD on it, had a timer and the secret was it had a keypad and there was no code to it um, basically. And we made people think there was a code to disarm it but there wasn't. What you had to do was actually get your MacGyver Swiss Army knife out and you had to un actually undo the bomb and there was a secret disarm switch on the inside and only one person actually figured out how to do that um, so and the track was if you trick was if you didn't get the bomb if you didn't disarm it um, it had reset it had wait three hours or something four hours or something like that before it would rearm itself so it basically meant you had to go home for the day and come back um, so it was a custom one which got lost in the flood, actually. It was placed under this bridge, and a one in a hundred year flood came along and totally washed it away. It was like five metres above the water level, but it got washed away, and we built another one, and then it went missing as well. So that was really annoying, but that was one of the first um, electronic... No, the first one was. I have the first electronic waypoint decoder. Uh, we were the first ones to do an electronic one, um, and this was from our, what's it called, Seeds of Life case, which isn't around anymore because... We placed that middle head. We placed it at middle head, and little did we know that um, it was at a gay nudist. Um, it was a notorious gay nudist spot. We had no idea, and it was called Seeds of Life. Okay, and um, <laughs> it's, it's it's just not good. So we had to remove this one pretty quickly. But it would basically have your mission orders on it, and if it works, will it still work after ten years? And it gives you the locations to the next door and the clue, but you had to figure out how to make it all work. And that was the first electronic waypoint decoder. That one was the second one. And then oddly, Dave came along with his play it against Sam, which was a classic. Oh, 23 minutes already. Oh, no, come on. All right, here I go. No more mucking around. Um, happily ever after. I just wanted to mention this one because this is a very good case that got teams competing. Um, and if you want to do something similar um, these days to get 
um, uh, teams actually competing against each other. It's a good thing. And what it was, um, uh, Bear Left would select some of the major teams in Sydney. We were one of them. Um, and then you were tasked with placing your hardest case within defined rules. In this case, it was four waypoints, uh, no, no real puzzles, and four waypoints. Um, so if you, if you were chosen to place a cache, you would have a one cache advantage against everyone else. And there were real prizes um, in, involved in this. I think it was a dinner for two at some really schmick restaurant. We actually came um, second. And um, what it was, it took about a week, uh, no, a couple of weeks, and all teams were competing against each other, not only the ones that placed them, um, so it was themed on, um, it was themed on the you know, Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs, so all the caches would be uh, called different um, characters from these dwarfs. And you've got a little dwarf um, statue as well, if you actually completed it. Um, and we actually, and it was so intense, the um, competition for this, we actually came second and we beat Zigifex by only 10 minutes after two weeks. We both converged on the final, from all over Sydney, we converged on the final waypoint and we beat them by 10 minutes to second place and we scored a gift voucher at uh, Paddy Palin or something. So that was pretty cool. And for our cache, uh, the idea was to place the cache hard enough to keep everyone at bay for a certain amount of time while staying within the rules. And we only had four waypoints. So we decided, and it had to be within inside the Sydney area, so we grabbed our Sydney Street directory and went, right, we'll place one at that boundary, down, up at Currajong, we'll place one at Camden, we'll place one down at, um, where's that? Uh, Gunner Bay. Gunner Bay or something, and one at Palm Beach, and the final would be smack in the centre, really at, um, at uh, Homebush Bay. So that actually kept, we knew people, it would have taken at least a day to drive. There was no hard puzzles, but... Physically, they had to drive all over Sydney, and that's what gave us the edge in the end because um, we didn't have to do this because we placed it, so we had a one case advantage. Um, so there you go. That was just a, um, a good way to um, uh, compete. Now, I'm not doing badly. 25 minutes of waffle. Here we go. Um, get smart. Um, this is the last one I'll do, by the way, unless every, anyone wants to hear about the others. Um, uh, Get Smart was the first and I think only interactive cache. This is the story everyone wants to hear. They love hearing it. Um, I'm not sure when it was, 2003 maybe, 2003 possibly. Um, and it was hype for months. Ideology had just done their II7. They numbered them all like um, II8 and II7 was a Get uh, was the one at the Opera House. Once again, you had to climb over the Opera House sails to actually get it. Um, it was ridiculous. You, if you didn't get arrested, you were, uh, you know, it was, you were pretty lucky. Um, but that one we're missing. That was a spy theme one, but this one was Get Smart theme. And it was totally themed on the Get Smart. It was hyped for months. And there was a serious first prize. You'd win a, uh, you'd win. The first prize was a ride in a helicopter around Sydney, anywhere you wanted to go in the ideology helicopter. They'd transfer you in their Porsche or Lotus and they'd, and they'd um, shout lunch as well. So it was a pretty major first prize. And um, it was totally themed on the show. And basically you were, get, you were Maxwell Smart and you were hunting down a suitcase bomb. And that was, that was the big thing. And uh, once again, you start, I'll go through waypoint by waypoint. This comes from the secret winners page which is on archive.org still, luckily, otherwise I'd pretty have much no, have nothing to show because we didn't get many photos back then. Not many people had digital cameras, really. Um, and this was the, actually, this was the page. This was the main, this is not the winner's page, this is the main page. You'd have background information, there'd be hype videos as well, which I couldn't get. Um, and, and, and the prizes and the conditions, you had to be under 109 kilos and, you know, all that sort of stuff. And people were having so many problems with it, actually getting the first couple of waypoints. They had to hold a spy class to teach us how to do some of the waypoints. And um, so this is us at the spy class, there's ideology. Um, and, and as it turns out, they actually forgot to give some of the coordinates. That's why it was so darn hard, or a decode key or something. So, um, and you'd get all cryptic orders from the chief, 86, if young people may not remember, Get smart, but it was all totally themed on the get smart thing. Even the orders and everything. It was really, it was really quite fun to do and very tricky. Now here's waypoint one, which is the telephone 
booth. You can't see it there, but there's the ginger loon and there's some telephone booths. This is in Central Railway Station, more urban embarrassment. The clues were hidden inside the phone booth um, in, in Central Railway Station. So he, there's the ginger loon just waiting for someone to get off the phone before he could go in there and because people didn't have mobile phones back then, uh, or not, not many did, and that's us bashing up uh, ideology because they forgot to give us the cohorts. Um, Waypoint 2 was in the University of New South Wales, it was the cone of silence, if you remember that from the ideology theme, and the clues were hidden inside this um, advertising board, and as you can see there's a whole bunch of caches inside there trying to decrypt, decrypt the clues which were hidden inside this cone of silence. That's uh, the ideology's Porsche, and there's the cone behind him, and there's the ginger loon trying to look. Because um, ideology was so cunning that ginger loon thought that they had hidden the clue in their own Porsche, which was parked in front of the cone of silence there. So he's searching their Porsche, he's under it, and he's doing all sorts of things. Um, and we'd all be hunting down this cache on the same day, by the way. It was, um, it was uh, because a lot of us turned up, this is after spy class, we all turned up and we'd all have new clues and after spending weeks on it already. And so that was kind of silence, huh? Oh yeah, yeah, that was Waypoint 2. Waypoint 3 was the shoe phone. They actually built a real shoe phone. There's a, that's probably the only photo in existence. We don't have one, but it would actually give you, it'd be like this, it'd have like a voice decoder in it. I think they got the idea from here and they put, um, uh, it'd have a keypad on it and you had to know the code to enable the, um, the actual um, the mission instructions would be encoded in the shoe phone. So you'd have to know the code, type it in, and um, that one was buried in a sewer pipe in the middle of a children's playground. So we look like uh, pedophiles um, running around this children's playground looking under all these gear, you know, all this stuff while all the kids are there. Um, it, was, it was absolutely terrible. Now they originally placed it at Luna Park, which turned out to be on private property. Um, there's Eco Nick there. And, um, and we were busted by the security at, um, at Luna Park who told us um, they were going to call the cops and um, yeah, we got the hell out of there. So um, they had to that ruin that one. Um, but as always, Team Chaos um, integrated that into the story. All the events were happening in real time on their website. So um, you would do that. So that's the shoe phone. And that was, yeah, you can read that, I think. Can everyone read that? Or is that, no? No? Oh, okay, okay. Just me. <clears throat> um, waypoint three is the old dice in the tree trick. Um, the waypoints would actually be encoded on, this, on these dice. Um, actually, not just on one side, but on multiple sides, and that's what you had to figure out. And as it turns out, it is possible to encode a, um, a location on a set of two, four, six, eight, dice, but only certain locations because you've got to use the flip side or something, so you had to actually figure all that sort of stuff out. And once again, it was all integrated into the, uh, into the theme and it was integrated into the mission orders and um, you would spend time um, just, uh, once again, we're still hunting down this suitcase bomb. Well, it's probably a month into it now. Uh, oh, the shoe phone, yeah, that was hit. They had to move it. They hid it in the abandoned in, in the in kids' uh, playground in a fake sewer pipe, uh, which was very cunning, and that's their Lotus, which they called the Cache Racer. <clears throat> and then they had one of these puzzles. Um, uh, I'm not sure if one of these impossible puzzles. I'm not sure if anyone... And really, unless you're very, very good at doing these things, this is one of the hardest ones you can get. And you'd put it... Oh, I'll show you some photos of it. And you'd put it together... It was like this, and it would had, had, have cohorts and the ideology symbols. Um, this is a model which, uh, which actually we made. This is a model of Turn It Round and Sandy Feet made. Team Fanar, they, um, they modelled it as well, because you got it in the case, and you couldn't solve it then and there, unless you were very lucky. So you had to make a model of it, and go back home, build a model, and physically solve it. And the, that's just a Soma problem. Uh, Soma, um, not on this one, there's only one solution. This, yeah, it's a variation of the Soma puzzle. And um, this one is a, the most difficult version of the Soma puzzle and it only has one solution. And the way I solved it is I um, put a message on the Rec Puzzles news group and I had a response. Somebody had written a program to solve it already 
and they did that within the hour. So, um, you know, I just um, encouraged the nerds on the uh, news groups to actually um, solve it for me. And while other people, mine sock had actually uh, solved it on a bit of paper. Um, there were web solutions, as he said, it's a classic SOMA puzzle, it's called. But it's actually very difficult. And, um, and the coordinates were hidden on the inside. Team Fanag thought the coordinates were hidden on the outside of it, and they only made an outside model of it. And it turns out the coordinates were hidden on the inside. So that was a really difficult thing. And along with that, one, it's all integrated into the theme as well, along with that you would get a CD, a Get Smart CD. You would actually get, I, 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 I didn't know it at the time, but Don Adams actually made a Get Smart, well, it wasn't a CD at the time, it was a record, and you can buy it on the CD, and it's like a whole hour of, like a whole, um, actually, a whole Get Smart one hour um, series on this CD, and you'd, you'd actually listen to it. And what they did is they embedded the secret code for the suitcase, because the suitcase had a combination lock on it, and they embedded the coordinates for the, uh, the combination for the suitcase into the CD. They actually uh, uh, audio dubbed the combination. So you had to listen to the whole one hour CD and get all the clues off it and try and figure out that there was a combination. They didn't tell you the combination was on there. Um, they just gave you this CD and you had to figure it out. Uh, Mind Socket wrote down all clues he found on a CD. And I won't go any further because I think the next one, yep, the next one is where it gets interactive. Um, as if it wasn't already interactive enough for the spy class, okay, what happened? I'll tell the story. After we decoded the CD and all the puzzle and all the clues, we'd get an email address, which was um, Siegfried at uh, chaos dot, <laughs> at uh, chaos.org or something. So Siegfried is one of the characters in one of the, uh, the main enemies in uh, Get Smart, for those that remember the laughs, yeah. So we we get an email to email him. So and we get an email back in broken German. It was very broken German to say turn up to this pub at Wednesday night or something. Turn up to this pub at 10 p.m. on a Wednesday night. Where was it? King's Cross. Oh, I don't know. Somewhere. Let's. I don't know. Anyway, turn up to this pub at 10 p.m. and go into the phone booth. Okay. And, and, and sure, so we turn up at 10 p.m. at night in the, you know, in, the, in this pub, and we sit, and there's a phone booth, a red phone booth, just like you see in Maxwell, just like you see in Get Smart, and there's this phone booth in there. So we're sitting there, uh, uh, looking at the phone booth, and everyone's looking at us. The pub's crowded, and we go into the phone booth, thinking, oh, there's a secret clue in there, right? There's another set of coordinates. There's another mission instructions, whatever. And we go in there, and I'm hunting around, and and people are starting to wonder what we're actually doing. And when we actually walked in, we thought we, we're, we're going to be watched. We thought ideology would be watching us, okay? And we walk into the pub, and the bartender, she uh, gets on a walkie-talkie and starts talking. And we thought, ah, the bartender's in on it. And I'll go into that later. Um, so we thought something's going down, and we couldn't find anything in this phone booth. Um, I was searching all through it. People were asking us what we're doing, and um, and then the phone booth rings. Okay, the phone booth actually rings. I'm in there and I'm going, oh shit! Everyone's looking at us in the pub because this phone booth is ringing. Okay, so I pick it up, expecting someone to be on the other end, and nothing. Um, so I put it back down. It rings again. Nothing. Rings again. Nothing. And. Uh, as it turns out, it was faulty. Something had happened to it. It, it. They were supposed to be on the other, Siegfried was supposed to be on the other end of the line to give us our further mission instructions. And, but nothing happened, okay? There was dead silence on the end of it. So we, we're sitting outside the phone booth just wondering what the hell's going on? And um, somebody walks past, slips us a mobile phone and takes off. And, as, and we had no idea who they were. They just handed us a mobile phone, walked off. And as it turns out, and we're sitting there going, what the hell is this? And then the mobile phone rings. And it's sure enough, it's uh, Siegfried in a broken German accent again on the phone. What did he say? Um, I can't speak German accent. Anyway, um, it was uh, basically head on over to the um, shopping centre car park over the road. 
and there's a flashing, go to the flashing red light. So we head on out of the pub, walk over to this, it's, it, now it's like 11 o'clock at 10.30 at night or something, so the car parks are all abandoned, it's all dark, and we can see a flashing red light up on the third story. And we go, well, how do we get up to the third story? The car park's all abandoned and it's probably locked, and we walk into this dark alleyway, and uh, uh, there's this door right under the red light. The red light's three stories above us, but there's this door, and it had a freshly cut hole in it. Okay, so I peeped through the hole and there's people wandering in and out. We're going, what the hell's you know, going on? There's people in there. Something's happening. So I know that this is in a dark alleyway. It's just that, you know, in a seedy suburb. It's, <laughs> it's terrible. So I knock on the door and nobody answers and we can't figure it out. So we, we hung around for a while. Then we walk back out to the street and um, we're just wondering what's going on. And somebody walks past in a trench coat with a, a hood down, and they slip us a note, and they walk off. Okay, and the note says, "Go up to the light, you moron," or something like that. And as it turned out, the hole in the door had nothing to do with it. It was my active imagination that just went wild. It had, I don't know why there was a hole in the door, why there were people in there. I have no in this stairwell, but it was a stairwell I could see in there. I have no idea. That was a complete furthy. And um, so we, we, fight, we make our way up the car park, um, up to the third level, and there's a flashing red bike light on the balcony. And then there's these Russian dolls. You know those <coughs> Russian dolls that go one inside each other? Yeah, and, and once again, that's from the Get Smart TV show. Okay, these Russian dolls, it's in one of the episodes. So we open up these Russian dolls like this, and this car park is abandoned, it's dark, it's night time, and we're scared shitless thinking we're on this real spy mission, okay? It was seriously, she was freaky, okay? <laughs> thinking we're just going to get caught. And um, so I opened these Russian dolls and there's a note inside, inside the smallest doll, and it said, go to the <coughs> lift on the northeast corner of the, of the uh, uh, car park and push the button. So, we wander over the abandoned car park, we walk up to the lift, and she's packing lumpies by now, okay? She's going, don't push the button, don't push the button, I'm scared, okay? And you really feel like you're on a real spy mission, and you push the button to the lift, and you wait for it to come up, the door's open, and there's the suitcase we've been searching for for like three months now. And there's this suitcase, and she didn't want me to go in. She thought the lift was rigged or something <laughs> like this. So I wander in, grab the suitcase, bring it out, and it had the combination on it. And we thought we had the combination for this thing. And we knew it was ideology. And ideology were notorious for just, you know, being nasty and booby trapping. I knew they had booby trapped the suitcase. If I open it, an alarm or something's going to go off. So we go into the stairwell. And we try the combination, we open it up, and sure enough, one of those screecher alarms, you know, those 110 decibel screecher alarms go off, and we could not hear ourselves think. And I had to, it took me a minute to take the thing apart and disarm this suitcase. But sure enough, that was it. We had the suitcase, inside the suitcase, a fake gun, a fake hand grenade, fake passports, fake money, and all this spy gear, and we thought, the cops have heard this. We're in an abandoned, yeah. we're in an abandoned stairwell with a fake gun and a fake hand grenade. If we get busted, we are in deep trouble. And and um, sure enough, there were three ideology hats inside, or two, or something. And um, and we knew that was it. We had we got the briefcase. We had disarmed the bomb. That was the bomb. The screecher alarm. You had to disarm it. We disarmed it. Case was over. And there's a note inside which says, "Go back to the pub." So we wander back to the pub, it's about 11.30 now, we walk in the door and everyone starts in, stands up and starts cheering, okay? It turns out that everyone, the secret was, is that if you had finished the cache, all the geocaches were there, the ones who had previously finished the cache, if you had previously done it and solved it as three or four, four teams had before us, um, unfortunately, um, they would be invited to turn up to the spy mission to spy on us while we did the case. And as it turns out, I, you, you, maybe you can't see it, the photo's not that great, but there's ideology, ready with a the suitcase, they're up on this 
uh, balcony overlooking the pub. They've got walkie talkies talking with other agents who are the caches um, stashed down on the street and everyone's looking at us via, via binoculars and we didn't see anyone. Okay? Now, as it, as it turns out, um, when we turned up, we turned up about 20 minutes early to, the, to actually do it and uh, we, want, we parked in front of Maccas around the street and we walked in and at the time, uh, we, we, we didn't see them, but apparently everyone was in there eating Maccas <laughs> and, and they had to dive under the desk to avoid being seen. It would have ruined the whole thing. And um, Ideology had this whole thing planned where it would be totally interactive. If you won, you're invited back to watch the next people. Think this is their plans. They had emergency backup plans in case the phone didn't work, in case you got busted by the cops, in case you couldn't get into the car park security. They had it all planned out various backup plans, and this was the final, or the exchange as they call it, the suitcase exchange. And as it turns out, uh, one of the previous teams, Team Fanag, um, uh, here's some spy photos, there's Oki mates who solved it before us, they're entering the pub. Um, they, they, I think they had like a, the, some long range telephoto thing which they captured. Um, Team Fanag, when they were doing it, the cleaner intercepted the suitcase as it was on its way up. So that they placed it on the basement. The uh, cleaner was on the second floor and he just happened to enter and he stole the suitcase. And Team Fanag actually had to figure out what the hell happened and um, go steal the suitcase back from the cleaner, as they did. Um, and, and so they really had an extra spy mission to do. It was fantastic. And um, this guy bought his own suitcase um, and it was getting quite an event. These are all the caches at the pub afterwards. Um, and uh, re it says, he living the waypoints is half the fun. And there's uh, um, Anne from, from Bushrats reliving the experience. Here's us. Um, when you sign the logbook, it had an exploding pen, just like in Get Smart. So you'd sign the logbook and the pen would explode in your face. It was quite dangerous and really hilarious. So that's us signing the logbook back at the, uh, back at the pub. And well, that's it. So that's the interactive Get Smart case story. And I don't think, is anyone aware of an interactive case since? There's I don't. A, there's one in Hobart. Hobart? Yes. Yeah, Stargate yep. 3 put together. We either right. Any not, not to that level. Not to that, okay, no. yeah. But there's no reason why you couldn't do something like that these days. Theme it and have it interactive. And I'm telling you, seriously, when you're in the middle of an abandoned car park and you're pushing the button on this lift and, and that door open and that suitcase is there, I felt like a secret agent, I'm telling you. That was... You know, it was real. I've been getting goosebumps just telling the story. I'm remembering it. It is really that intense occasion experience. It doesn't, you know, it might sound very simple, but when you're there and you have no idea what's happening and you're, you know, in that sort of situation, it's just, it's just really amazing. And um, yeah, Ideology put so much work into that. And sure enough, I don't have photos, but they won their helicopter flight and their, and their uh, Porsche transfers and everything. And yeah, that was just a. That was just a fantastic um, interactive cache, and um, really there's been nothing like it since. So uh, that's probably all I have time for. I've been yapping on for 47 minutes, would you believe it? So that's it. Um, that's all I have. And if you want to hear some of the other caching stories, which were um, some of the other major ones at the time, were uh, Play It Again Sam, um, which was another one which um, had an um, interactive one, if you want to hear about that, let me know. Oh, I won't go into it. If you want to hear about those, let me know. Uh, there's lots of other major mega caches back then. I didn't have time to go through all of them. I was way over time, so thank you very much, guys. And that's it.